Hi everyone and welcome back to another video. My name is Richard Seidlitz and I'm the owner of redpants.lol. As you could probably surmise based on the fact that I'm wearing not one but two jackets, even though I'm indoors, I'm no longer in Florida. I'm currently in Idaho. Even though both myself and my car are here, each of us in one piece, it doesn't mean that things went according to plan. In fact, it didn't go according to plan at all, there were some pretty big deviations. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about everything that had happened during that road trip. Before we begin, let's go over some background information so you guys have a bit of context for why I was concerned or focused on some of the things I'm gonna talk about in this video. First up is my car. You see, this isn't just any Aston Martin. It's a highly modified Aston Martin. And with any modification, you're gonna have some give and take on a number of factors. With a lot of stuff, it could just be the price point. For some stuff, it could be reliability. For some things, it'll be comfort. There's a lot of things that can play into it. And in this situation, I had a little bit of everything to worry about. You see, not long before I started this road trip, I supercharged my engine. And I did that when it already had well over 80,000 miles on it. I think it was like 82 or 83 or some odd thousand miles on it. I'll check and put up the thing, uh, put up the odometer when uh, I put up this video. But the point being that even then, the engine had a lot of miles in it. And those miles were not kind. I've done a lot of track days. The car's been wrecked a couple times. Uh, it's been through a lot. So this is not a baby to car whatsoever. And then I supercharged it. That was something I had to worry about. In addition to that, I have knee, back, and neck issues from my time in the Marine Corps, and I just put a set of Cobra Nagaro seats in this thing. They're not adjustable except for forward and aft, so there's going to be a lot of concern there for how I would feel. And this is something that's really particular for a lot of people, because I've actually talked to a number of people that are worried about their knees or comfort in general with these cars, especially if you have a manual like I have. And that's something that I want to touch upon real quick before we continue. About four or five years ago, I replaced the clutch in this car with one from Velocity AP. It's a twin plate clutch that I talked about quite a bit in a couple of other videos, one being the transmission video that I did not too long ago, and one being one that just talked about the Velocity AP clutch a long while back. And honestly, I don't remember what that one from a long while back was, because I haven't even watched it again in so, so long. I don't even remember what I talked about. But I did have a video just about this clutch package. But the reason it's worth mentioning that is because the clutch pedal in that, with that clutch with this car is super light compared to what the factory clutch was like in this car. And that's worth knowing for those of us that have knee issues. Whenever I would do long distance driving, after about an hour, hour and a half, my knee would start to cramp up a bit. It would get uncomfortable. And for long haul drives, like the seven hour trek that I would do to go to Lime Rock for the Aston Martin Owners Club event that I attend each year there, well, not this year. <sighs> Anyway, after seven hours, my knee would be in excruciating pain. And so having a super light clutch pedal like I now have in this car is a savior. It's life-saving because I would not be able to do the long drives that I did multiple times in a row during this road trip had it not been for that lighter clutch pedal. So it is worth mentioning. It's not just a sales pitch. Yes, I do sell them. And those sales, again, are what makes it possible for me to make these videos and pay my bills. But I do sell them for a reason. One, the performance. Two, the longevity of the clutch parts. And three, because it does make a huge difference for those of us with knee issues. So that's what I wanted to say about that. And it is in the context of this video since we're talking about driving for such great distances. If you have a manual clutch, you or manual transmission, you may wanna look into that if that is an issue for you. So this trip was going to be an interesting test, not just of myself with how I would do with my new modifications, but also of my car. When I started this trip, it had over 85,000 miles on it. And like I said, they were not easy miles. So it was going to be very interesting to see how the car reacted to be dri being driven so far for so long at a time after it had been through as much as it has. And going from Florida where it's humid and sunny and warm and all that other stuff to Northern Virginia where it's much, much colder but still humid, down to Texas and then up to Idaho where Idaho, again, super cold. It's actually snowing outside, which is why I'm wearing multiple layers. Um, Idaho, again, super cold but super dry. So very different environments that I'd be going through for each leg of this trip, each portion of this trip. And it would probably expose a number of issues. And I think that actually did happen. 
Any trip across the United States is a big deal. It's a very long distance and it will take a lot of driving to cover. In this trip, for example, I didn't just do a straight line from Florida to Idaho. I went up and down from here to Virginia, to Tennessee, to Texas, and then up to Idaho. It was a bit of a zigzag trip across the US and I did well over 4,000 miles as a result of that. The first leg of my trip was going from Florida to Northern Virginia, and this was going to cover 900 miles over the course of 13 hours. And during this drive, I ended up having two different but related issues with my supercharger. And both of these were related to installation. You see, the first one was a boost leak that was because of a plug on the underside of the intake manifold that I didn't properly seal. And the second one was because of a vacuum leak on the brake booster hose where I had lost an O-ring. I'm not sure where the O-ring went. It might've been one of those things that just slipped off when I was doing something. I don't know, O-ring's gone, vacuum leak. Both of those manifested in different ways. The boost leak being because under boost, sometimes it would have full boost, sometimes it would be less. And the vacuum leak being that when I sat at idle, sometimes if that seal wasn't quite there because of the missing O-ring, my idle, my idle would sit at about 2000 RPMs. Resealing the plug to fix the boost leak required removing the supercharger and intake manifold. These both come out together as one unit and it's a very daunting task. But Fraggle and I have a good amount of experience doing this because we had to do it a few times for various things. And we got to the point where we could do that. We could, un we could remove the supercharger and intake manifold, fix the issue and put it back together in two hours flat. So daunting it may be, but it's not the end of the world. Not that big of a deal. The rest of the supercharger kit, can be a huge pain to install, at least once you've done the top side once or twice, not too bad. But we fixed that. Unbeknownst to me, we broke a wire, and the wire was for a coolant temperature sensor. When that wire broke, we didn't realize it, and we put everything back together, we turned the car on, and the coolant temperature gauge spiked to the maximum level. I got a whole bunch of scary warnings, and the engine sort of just got really pissed off. So, took it back apart again, found the broken wire, put it back together, and everything was fine. Now fixing the uh, vacuum leak that was on the brake booster hose, much easier. It took probably five minutes to figure out where the, where the leak was, just a can of spray and figure out what reacts, uh, you know, where it reacts, you know you found your leak. Uh, put on an O-ring, everything sorted, easy fix. It took longer to find the leak than it did to fix the leak. Another thing that happened right after I arrived in Virginia was that I found I had a bunch of condensation in my passenger taillight. Now, this happened a long while back with my driver side tail light, and I fixed that one. I made a video for how you can fix this yourself, what causes it, all this sort of stuff, uh, a whole DIY video, but I don't think I ever uploaded the video uh, to my YouTube channel. It's on my computer, but the moving company lost it, so if they can figure out where my computer is and I can get that back, I can upload it to YouTube and share that with you guys. But it's something I now have to do on my passenger side tail light as well. Not to worry about it, I just hope I fix it before the, the uh, condensation messes up the taillight. Um, in that video that I will upload if I can find my original or if I have to remake it with this one, um, I'll explain about the whole condensation issue, what causes it, how to fix it, why it's an issue. I'll go into all that, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you wanna see more about that. But that is something that I found the next day after I arrived in Virginia. Um, the next thing was a couple days later, I was going to Potomac Cars and Coffee. The route to Potomac Cars and Coffee took me on some very broken, horrible, horrible roads. Uh, those of you in the DMV may recognize those as 495. There's a lot of construction going on there. The roads are just horrendous. I was actually trying to film and talk uh, while driving there um, to Potomac Cars and Coffee. I don't know if the video came out. If so, it'll be somewhere around this part of the video. But while I was trying to film that, I got a really nasty rattle. My original thought was that this rattle was coming from one of the screws up here in the windshield vents. Uh, there's those plastic vents right there and there are screws that hold those in place. And if those loosen, you'll get a really nasty rattle that'll kind of reverberate off of the windshield and it's pretty obnoxious. But I don't think that was it. Honestly, I didn't even check to see if the screws were missing. Uh, I totally forgot until I was making this video. But uh, I don't think that was the issue because a couple days later, I ended up finding a screw that was sitting dead center of the floor mat of the driver's side footwell area. 
and the rattle was gone. So if that was the screw, I don't know where it came from because it had to have fallen from out from under the dash because there's no way it fell up and out of the vent and then walked across the car and dropped in the footwell. I have no idea. Uh, but the rattle's gone and I now have an extra screw. Hopefully it wasn't an inch long screw holding my engine in. That'll be a whole other issue. But that problem has resolved itself. Another thing that happened while I was there was my passenger side window stopped working. Again, I have a video for that. It was a quick fix. I just had to pull out the fuse and then reinsert the fuse, window reset. But I think it is symptomatic of the passenger door module going on my car. Uh, every once in a while, my remote fob, the key fob for my doors don't work if I, wanna, uh, uh, if I want to lock my car. Uh, when I unlock it, usually works just fine, but locking it every once in a while, it doesn't work. And what I found is that I, if I open and close my passenger door, it will allow it to lock. Sometimes also separately, the puddle light in the bottom side of the passenger, passenger door won't turn off. So I think it's a module issue where there's just a signal that isn't being sent to lock the doors or turn off the puddle lights, whatever. It's another thing to add to my list. After leaving Virginia, I had an overnight stop in Tennessee. I was only there for one night just to crash for a bit to break up a very long drive to Texas. I got to see a buddy of mine that just moved there with his family and catch up with him, but other than seeing him, it was a pretty uneventful stop. From there though, I left very early the next morning at sunrise, which was gorgeous by the way, to start my trip to Texas. Getting from Tennessee to Texas was the longest segment of my trip. It was 1,000 miles and took 15 hours. Now, despite the incredibly long drive, the trip itself was mostly uneventful. Well, except for a vomit-inducing bathroom at a gas station in Arkansas. And my infotainment system stopped working a few times. It froze up, which is something I'll talk about later on in the video. Uh, aside from that, it was just fine. It was just a really long drive. So then there's Texas. This is where things get really interesting. Up until this point, I had some minor issues, you know, the boost leak, the vacuum leak, the condensation, the rattle, okay, whatever, not that big of a deal. But then came Texas. So I was stopping in the north side of the Dallas-Fort Worth area to meet up with a buddy of mine named Bruce, who you should be very familiar with if you've seen my last few videos. Bruce also has a supercharged V8 Vantage and we were going to get together to make some videos, one talking about the differences between the two and what we thought about supercharged V8 Vantages in general, and also another one doing a back-to-back -back dyno comparison to see how the two supercharged V8 Vantages would compare. Well, if you've seen the last few videos, you would know how that dyno attempt turned out. Before we did that though, we replaced my starter. Now I have had a starting issue for a long time. It may have been, it's somewhere between several months and a year that this has been going on. Um, so during that time, I've replaced my coil packs and my spark plugs, that didn't fix it. Uh, we replaced my starter while I was in Texas with Bruce, that didn't fix it. The starter was obviously bad, but I think there's another issue because during the dyno session we did and some of the initial, you know, not full on runs, but the initial warm up runs, we noticed inconsistent fueling with my car. Now between the starter issue or the startup issue uh, and the inconsistent fueling, I'm pretty sure that I have a fuel system issue. Uh, that would be either the fuel pump is going bad or the fuel driver module is going bad or the fuel pressure regulator is leaking or something along those lines that's causing my car to have some other issues, uh, including the inconsistent fueling on the dyno and the bad startup. So I've got an appointment later on uh, with a local technician that's gonna help me out to try to chase this down, but that's also why we didn't do any more dyno runs after I got the new radiator. But the new radiator was the thing that we need to talk about next because what an adventure. We were at the dyno shop at Evolution Dynamics and my radiator decided it didn't want to be a radiator anymore. It said, F it, I'm going to go make a sandwich and left me holding all my own coolant. Well, no, it was the shop floor at Evolution Dynamics that was holding the coolant. But anyway, I digress. The radiator decided it was no longer going to do its job and quit. 
Well, I ordered another radiator. And in the pursuit of trying to find some cost savings, not only for myself, but that I could pass along to you guys, I ordered the equivalent Jaguar radiator. And then decided to just stay in Texas and wait for it to arrive, so I extended my hotel stay. Well, the next day, my tooth broke. Because that's what happens on road trips, apparently. Uh, I bit into a cheeseburger, and it felt like I was biting into a rock, which wasn't quite right. Well, it turned out I was biting into a chunk of my own tooth. So uh, my tooth broke, which was fantastic. Luckily, I was able to find a dentist that could see me for an emergency visit, and they gave me a temporary crown. So the Jaguar ready had arrived, and it was, uh, it was not the one that I needed. And I made a video about that, so you can go check that out. But at that point, I decided Christmas is coming up. I'm not waiting a few more days to see if this works. I need to get back to Idaho for Christmas. So book a flight and go from Dallas to Boise that same day. So upon touching down at the Boise airport, I call up my parents to let them know that I had arrived and they inform me that I cannot see them because my dad's cancer has returned and he is back in treatment for it. Given his compromised immune system, they understandably told me that I could not see them until I got a COVID test and a clean bill of health. So I went from the airport to a hotel and scheduled the first COVID test that I could get. Now I wasn't too worried because I hadn't had any symptoms. I always wear a mask in public, I do all the safety things, I wash my hands constantly, I do everything you're supposed to do in order to mitigate the risk of COVID. Well, 12 hours after taking the test, it came back positive. It wasn't until after I got those positive results that I lost my senses of taste and smell, got a really nasty cough, and flu-like exhaustion. Now granted, my situation wasn't too bad compared to what other people have gone through. For example, my parents know people that have died from COVID and a buddy of mine was hospitalized for a month in intensive care because of it. And granted, he had underlying issues and I didn't, which maybe that's why my, my issue was pretty mild compared to what he went through. But again, the issue is my dad, not me. So what I went through was basically a really nasty cough and a lot of sleep. I couldn't focus on anything, I couldn't function. After the symptoms had cleared and I was back okay and the requisite amount of time had lapsed, I was able to see my parents and that was great. And then I had to go back to Texas. It was a weird thing to have to tell my parents, hey, I need to fly back to Texas because my radiator and tooth are ready. But sure enough, the permanent crown for my tooth and my new, new radiator were ready for me in Texas. So I booked a flight and I flew down to Texas back to Dallas. So I get back to Bruce's house in Texas and open up the box and out comes my new, new radiator and new radiator hoses and I find that I can't use them. You see, in my COVID-induced delirium, I had ordered the radiator from a 4.7 liter Vantage rather than from a 4.3 liter like I have. And one of the things they changed when going to that new engine was different radiator and radiator hoses. The issue is the connections where the radiator hoses go into the radiator. They are different and they are not interchangeable from one to the other. So what I had to do at that point was to order a new, new, new radiator or new, new radiator hoses of the right kind. And at that point, I just sort of mentally clicked off. I was done, but Bruce had another idea. He said, well, why don't you just put my radiator in your car? So that's what we did. Wanting to get all this over with and done with the jumping through loops and waiting and all this other nonsense, I decided, screw it, let's do it. So we took out my 14 year old, nearly 90,000 mile radiator and put in his 14 year old, 26,000 mile radiator. His 14 year, 26,000 mile accident free radiator. Anyway, we dropped it in and everything was good to go. And for those of you wondering, yes, he got to keep 
all the new parts that I had ordered, including the radiator and the new, new radiator hoses for the new, new radiator, which are now in his 2007 V Advantage. There are some differences with the radiator fans and the different setups, so it's not a direct drop in. He was able to make it work because he has a lot of experience with making things work. Uh, it's not a huge revision, but there are some differences. Before we called it a night, we went ahead and flushed my brake fluid, not just from the brake lines, but also from the clutch line, which is something very important to know if you have a manual transmission. My brake fluid was way beyond its service life. And even though I knew that, it was extra confirming to see what came out. Remember folks, your brake fluid should look like a crisp Pilsner, not a dark stout. I got back to my hotel a little bit after midnight that night, and the next morning I was up bright and early to go back to the dentist that I had seen just a few weeks prior to get that permanent crown. My 30 minute appointment ended up taking nearly two hours, and then from there I set out on the seven hour drive to head to Clayton, New Mexico, where I'd be staying for the night. The only thing that was notable about that segment of my trip was that I came to learn that eating and drinking with a broken face is way, way more difficult when you're driving than it is when sitting at a table. My face is still a little bit wonky, way better than last time though. The hotel I stayed at in Clayton, New Mexico was really old by American standards. I think it was built in the 1800s. I know those of you watching in Europe, for example, are like, <laughs> yes, I know, England is where the history comes from. I think that's an Eddie Izzard thing. And I think a lot of the things in that hotel were original. For example, all the floorboards were uneven and creaked, and the door of my hotel room was so old that the wood paneling had started to separate from itself and you could see light shining through it. And I'm not even talking about the door jams, I'm talking about through the door itself. I should have taken a video of that now that I think about it, my bad. But aside from being really old, it was nice and clean and it had a lot of characteristic, you know, charm to it. Uh, and it was quiet. There was, I don't think there was anybody else in the hotel. I didn't hear anybody else at least. And I think that's kind of surprising given how I could hear every footstep I made on those floorboards. But it was lovely. The next day was another long segment that was gonna take me all the way up to Tremonton, Utah, which is on the north side of Salt Lake City. This is going to take 13 hours and cover 850 miles. Now this was the other of the two segments that I was really worried about for my trip. The first one being because it was a long drive and it was the first long drive that I'd be doing with my new seats and supercharger. This one I was worried about because again, long drive, but I would be going through a few areas that could become very treacherous for a supercharged Aston Martin on summer tires if the weather turned bad. Luckily, nothing really happened. There were a few spots where I came across snow that had been drifting across the highway, had to drop speed a little bit, uh, but other than that, no big deal. However, I did come across one big traffic jam, which I found out when I got up to the scene of the accident that caused it, was because of a car flipping over and there it sat on its roof. And the weirdest part about that was it wasn't the only one. A few hours later in the day, I came across another car sitting on its roof. Two in one day, no idea how or why that would happen, but there it was. Other than that, I was able to get all the way up to Tremonton, saw some incredibly beautiful areas, which I think I have to say was probably the most beautiful, beautiful day of driving was going through Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah. Absolutely stunning scenery. The other thing about this segment of the trip was it wasn't my original plan. It's not the route I was supposed to take. I was originally gonna go from Dallas to Austin and then from Austin to Phoenix and then Phoenix to Vegas and then Vegas up to Idaho. But after everything I'd been through with the radiator and the Rona and the tooth and all the other crap 
Plus, there was a storm that I was worried about that was coming through that was gonna drop some snow, or at least potentially drop some snow in an area that would be pretty hazardous to me. I decided that my physical safety and mental stability were more important than the route that I was gonna take. So to those of you that I didn't get to see during that segment of the trip, I am very sorry. I know there's a few of you that are gonna be watching this video. Um, I was gonna meet up with you guys in Austin, Tucson, Phoenix, and Vegas. I'm sorry that I didn't reach out to you guys or that I either didn't reach out to you because I wasn't sure when I'd be coming through or I had to cancel because I decided to change my plans, whichever one it was, I do apologize. But yeah, except for some high winds in some places and a bit of snow uh, that had drifted across the highway and others, it was a pretty relaxing drive. That and the rolled over cars. I still don't get that, that still baffles me. The hotel that I stayed at the next night was the one in Tremonton, Utah. And I have to say it was very, very different from the one the night before down in New Mexico. While that one had been super old, but nice and clean, this one was much newer and not very pleasant. I mean, the first room that I had, I checked in and I got into my room. I had a sink that didn't drain. I had a broken TV remote control and there was a not very mysterious white bit of splatter crusted on the side of a piece of furniture. Yeah, the lady at the front desk was nice about it. She put me in a different room, but that didn't really do anything for the rather noisy guests that kept running up and down the hallway until two in the morning. So I woke up in a weird mood the next day. I was kind of like, it was the last day of my trip and I just wasn't in a great mood uh, because of my experience with the hotel that night. And then, you know, it was freezing cold. My car was covered in a sheet of ice. Not a big deal. Let the car warm up, scrape off the windshield, whatever. But then the drive from there into Idaho just didn't feel right. It was, it was a strange feeling because Eastern Idaho, which is usually pretty, had this weird gloomy, foggy haze that settled over everything. So for the majority of my time driving through Idaho, which should have been one of those, oh, here I am, I'm in the last leg and this is beautiful and wonderful, it was actually really bleak and, and unpleasant. And there wasn't anything that I had to worry about with traffic, traffic was quick, uh, there weren't any traffic jams, nothing went wrong. It was just, didn't feel right. And it's a weird thing to say, given, you know, that nothing went wrong. It's just weird. It, it didn't feel like the triumphant end to this long journey that I'd gone through so much to endure. It, it was just kind of like, uh, uh. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm spending all this time looking for breaks in the clouds or something. And I didn't get those breaks in the clouds until I got into Boise. Once I got into Boise, the clouds cleared up and I could see the foothills, which are gorgeous. But that was it. And, and, and at that point, I wasn't even looking at the landscape anymore. I was looking on it at, at ways to see how many minutes I had left in my drive because my bladder was about to burst. So I was too focused on my bladder to enjoy what little bit of scenery I got once I got into Boise. But I did get into Boise and my bladder did survive and that's the important thing. From driveway to driveway, my road trip took 4,162 miles of driving and 2,800 miles of flying and three radiators and a tooth and COVID because road trip. I'd already mentioned several things that had happened with my car, but there's a few more things I wanna cover real quick before we finish up this video. The first I had already mentioned briefly, it was my infotainment system that had frozen up while I was driving. I have the infotainment upgrade kit from Aston Installations in this car, and every once in a while, I think it was five times total during the course of the trip, the system would freeze up. Now it was easy to fix, all I had to do was stop at a gas station and lock the car. After several minutes, all the electronics in the car are powered down, and when the infotainment system gets powered down, that then resets the module for the infotainment upgrade kit. Well, each time it froze up, it happened in a shorter time period. The first time I think was after five or six hours. The second time was after less than less than less until the last time it happened after a little over an hour. Now, when I'm driving for at one point 13 or 15 hours in a day, actually that was like two or three points, 13 to 15 hours in a day, having to stop every hour is a big deal 
to reset that. So at one point I just said, screw it. And I started reaching back and physically unplugging the kit whenever I had it freeze up. But then it stopped freezing. It hasn't frozen since. And that includes on a couple of very long drives, it stopped freezing. So I don't know what happened. Um, I did talk to James over at Aston Installations about this during my drive, letting him know what was going on. And he said he was gonna send me a new kit uh, to or at least the module to replace to make sure that I had the latest firmware and make sure everything was okay. And if there was anything, he would take care of it, which I absolutely appreciate. But after it sort of resolved itself, I called him up and I said, hey, don't worry about it. Don't waste the money. Don't waste the effort because it seems to have resolved itself. But I know that if it does happen again, I'll give James a ring and James will up give me an updated kit and everything will be okay. Another thing that happened was the loading and the unloading of my car on the flatbed truck tore up my tow strap. It's right over there. It is functional. It is an actual race car part because I have the front end from a GT4 race car on here. Um, it's something I'll talk about in another video, I'm sure, but it's a cloth tow strap and the metal cable that is used to pull the car up and hold its weight as it's being unloaded uh, does chafe on that leather or er, on that uh, cloth strap. It's not the first time I've had to load and unload my car on a flatbed. The first time was during a rally where my shifter cable popped off and I had to have a tow truck come. And again, it was a flatbed, but this time, that time it just lifted up the front end of my car. I got underneath, I fixed the issue. Um, I think I talked about it in a video at some point. If not, um, maybe I will someday. But the tow strap just needs to be replaced. It's starting to get chewed up from wear and tear, which I guess is a bad thing that I've abused my car to the point of needing to replace the tow strap from wear and tear. The last thing I want to touch upon is the suspension. Now, I was worried initially about the seats, which are those new Cobra Nagaro seats that I installed. I was worried about those affecting ride comfort, especially over super long drives. Well, it turns out that they were perfectly fine. What ended up being an issue was my suspension. Now again, my car at this point now has just over 90,000 miles on it. I have the standard shocks that came in the 2007 way back in the day with H&R springs. The car does look beautiful with the lowered stance. I love the way it looks. And on smooth roads and on track, it is great. You know, it, it handles beautifully, it rides smoothly, but it's really low and it can be a bit tough on the kidneys depending on the roads you're driving on. And case in point was when I was driving up to Potomac Cars and Coffee, holy crap, that was uncomfortable. And that's when I, I first started to realize how much of my concern was misplaced in the seats when it turned out to be the suspension that I should worry about. Now, I, th I think one of the issues is that the suspension is pretty old. I know I get, uh, when I was down in Florida, I had a little bit of a squeak from the bushings when I was getting in and out of my driveway. It's much worse now that I'm in a cold environment like Idaho in the winter. It's much more pronounced. The squeaking of the bushings is much louder. Uh, the ride isn't as smooth as it used to be. Um, so I think the suspension's just on its way out. And again, that may be one of those things that is affected more so by the cold weather and exacerbated by that change of climate. I could get away with it in Florida, but now that I'm outside of Florida, I can't get away with it anymore. So what I'm gonna end up doing is replacing my current set of springs and shocks, which together are a coilover as one assembly. Uh, I'm gonna be replacing those. And as a lot of you know, I uh, was the one that sort of got BC Racing to develop their kit for the Aston Martin V Vantage. And I worked with them directly to develop that. I was the one that provided them with spring rates and test platforms and all this other stuff. And we worked on that together to make that happen. I had those on my Red V8 Vantage when I had that car, and I loved them. I was very happy with what we did and the end result of that of that work together. Um, the product is fantastic, and I still recommend it to people all the time. There's no reason for me to use anything else, except that, like I did with the radiator, I want to try other things. I want to be able to test things for you guys, and so one of the things that I'll be testing out is a new set of coilovers from a buddy of mine over in Germany that he has been developing. I'll have a whole video about that. I'm just waiting for international travel because I'm actually going to be bringing him from Germany to the U.S. to do the installation his, himself so that I can get him on camera and we can talk about what he's done. We can talk about, you know, not just that product, but some other stuff that we're going to be doing in conjunction with those coilovers. So, Obviously, if you want to keep up to date on all this stuff that's going on, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And if you liked the stuff that I'm doing and sharing with you guys, please hit that like button because that does feed the algorithm and YouTube demands it so that it, you know, in order to get out to a broader audience. 
So that's everything I have this time, but make sure you come back regularly because I'm gonna be doing some more stuff in the next few weeks. Uh, everything from fixing my tail light to some DIY stuff in the engine bay, both of which are common issues for these cars. Uh, I've got some more DIY stuff in that regard. I'm also gonna be doing some more informational videos in conjunction with those things. Uh, so there's gonna be a lot to go over and a lot to learn uh, soon. Plus I've got some new products going on this car that I'll be sharing with you as well. So there's a lot happening. That's what I've got for you and I'll see you in the next video.